Hello, and welcome to Japan-only PlayStation Games Volume 2, the series where we aim to shine a spotlight on some of the many PS1 games that never made their way over to the West. First off, a big thank you to everybody who took the time to check out Volume 1. It's been by far my most successful video since starting the channel a few months ago, and I really do appreciate all the comments and positive feedback, so thank you. It really does mean a lot. If this is your first time tuning in, however, don't worry, let's quickly get you up to speed with the show's format. My goal is to watch 10 seconds of footage from every PS1 game using a YouTube channel called the Virtual Gaming Library. Anytime a Japanese exclusive game showed up, I put it down on a list. Text heavy games are unfortunately excluded from the list due to the language barrier, but in rare cases where there's a translation, a guide, or the game just looks too cool to ignore, then they'll make it onto the list too. So how do we decide which games to play? Well, we're gonna leave that up to chance. From here, we take every single game we've jotted down and then add them to a list randomizer. Once we've randomized the list, we then take the top 100 games and add them into a big spinning prize wheel. We're then gonna spin the wheel three times, and whatever three games we land on, those are the games we'll be looking at in today's episode. So what are we gonna play? Who knows? Good games, bad games, weird games, whatever they are. When it comes to Japan, you know you're always gonna be in for something interesting at least. So, let's not waste any more time, you're here for the games, and as always, the wheel will provide. The wheel will provide. Volume 2's first game is Lucifer Ring, released in Japan towards the end of 1998 and developed by Soft Machine. Soft Machine isn't exactly a household name, having only developed a handful of games, but oddly enough I did own what I think is their only western release, a PS1 game called Crisis Beat. This is a 3D brawler, think of it kinda like Final Fight meets Under Siege, so you know, battering goons on a boat, the video game. The PlayStation isn't exactly well known for its 3D brawlers, but I've always been a big fan of the genre, so I'd go out of my way to try any I could get my hands on, and this was always one of my favourites as a kid. So imagine my surprise when I find out that Soft Machine released another 3D brawler only a few months later in Japan, that I only just found out exists right now. That's fun. This is still a 3D beat-em-up, but as I'm sure you can tell, the biggest change here is the move into a fantasy setting. When I think of beat-em-ups, my mind always wanders to one of two settings. Vigilantes are cops beating up enemies in a modern setting, or wielding weapons and magic in a fantasy setting. Many of the famous games in the genre used either of these two settings, and I feel like Soft Machine were trying their spin at each with their two releases here. Modern with Crisis Beat, and then Fantasy with Lucifer Ring. In this game, you play as a guy called Nash, our generic hero protagonist. Bad stuff is going down, and it's up to you to collect the four power rings, but they, uh... They kind of look like mugs though, I don't know. And once you collect these rings, you eventually get to take on the ultimate evil. That may sound like a pretty crappy synopsis, but I genuinely think that's all there is to it. As far as beat em up fundamentals go, Lucifer Ring plays as you'd expect. Control is good, allowing you full 3D movement across the stages, although things are kept relatively simple with just a jump and dash as your additional movement option. When it comes to combat, you can execute a set of simple combos by using either the quick or heavy attack buttons, as well as utilize the expected jump and dash attacks. Lastly, the game also features a straightforward magic system for your strongest attacks. There's a meter under your health bar that fills when you either take or deal damage. If you use your magic attack when the meter isn't full, you'll execute a weak magic attack that does cost no meter, but does take some of your health if it connects with an enemy. If you wait until the meter is full though, you'll unleash a very powerful screen-wide attack that will kill most enemies instantly and do massive damage to bosses. This does reset the meter, but it's something you'll want to take advantage of at every opportunity. 
Levels are mostly linear walks from beginning to end, but can feature branching paths, plenty of traps, and even the odd bit of platforming, the latter of which is not great at all. Whenever you get into a combat section, the game usually locks you into an arena, using these red barriers until you kill the required number of enemies. These are fine most of the time, but enemies can sometimes get launched a good distance outside of the barriers, and on rare occasions it can take them quite a long time to wander back into combat range, which is kind of annoying. The game's most unique feature is probably its sword system. A sword will be your only weapon during the game, but you can find additional elemental blades within levels if you are lucky to find them. These swords have the same moveset as your default sword, but they deal way more damage against certain enemies, and they also have additional elemental effects, like the ability to freeze enemies with the ice sword. And each sword also has its own unique magic attack when the meter is fully charged. Do they add much extra to the gameplay outside of a damage buff? No, not really. And there is only four of them, but the magic attacks do look pretty cool at the very least. I feel conflicted with this game, because it is pretty fun, but at the same time, it's also incredibly bare bones for a PS1 take on the genre. Lucifer Ring genuinely feels like playing the original Golden Axe in 3D, like there's not much you can do in this game that you couldn't do in the original Golden Axe. In fact, there's probably lots more you could do in the original Golden Axe that you can't even do in this game. For one thing, this is a single player beat em up, which is genuinely sacrilege in the genre. But worse yet, Nash is this game's only playable character. So while I don't mind simple movesets and beat em ups, because you know, there's usually some replayability with the different characters, this game has one character with a really simple moveset. It's really disappointing. This means you'll probably have a good time playing through the game's 5 different levels in under 60 minutes like I did, but there's literally nothing to come back to. You don't unlock any extra characters, nor do the game's branching paths offer anything meaningful. I mean, you can select an elemental sword when you start the game now, but that's pretty much it. The reason I say I'm conflicted is because I actually think the core game itself is pretty good. The combat, while basic, is fun and responsive. The graphics can be a bit rough at times, but for the most part, I love how some of these locations look. There's lots of colour, tons of variety, and every stage feels unique. And the game has a ton of different enemies to fight too. They don't behave too differently outside of being a ground, ranged, or flying type enemy, but there is a huge amount of visual variety in the designs, way more than you'd probably expect. And the bosses are by far the highlight, I'd say. Levels usually feature both a mid-boss and an end-level boss, which keep you on your toes with some fun patterns. It's just a shame that these are usually a bit too easy, especially if you have the right elemental sword and magic, you can delete their massive health bars in no time. Both their designs are the best in the game, and they're always fun while they last. Sound quality, on the other hand, is a... Uh, it's, it's a mixed bag. Sound effects and the odd voice dialogue are generally quite good, but the game's music ranges from pretty nice... to genuinely some of the worst I've ever heard. One of the game's boss teams does have blast beats in it though. So look, maybe the soundtrack is a classic after all. Who's to say? In the end, I think I'm more disappointed than anything with Lucifer Ring because I see a lot of potential here, but the combat is just too simple to really hold up for more than a single playthrough, and this only gets worse when the game is single player with one playable character. Beat em ups generally got a lot of flack in this era for being too repetitive and low on replayability, and this might be one of the worst examples of this. If you can set aside all this though, and you just wanted to play a simple, straightforward beat em up in a cool fantasy setting with varied enemy design and solid fundamentals, you'll probably have a really good time with this. There's much worse ways you can kill an hour for sure. In fact, funnily enough, if you wanted to try it, this game did see a release on the North American PSN as a PS1 import title, probably thanks to the game being majorly in English and very Western friendly. So does this even count as a Japan-only PS1 game? Well, since you can only play it on a PS1 console using a Japanese copy, I'll, I'll go with yeah. Plus, I've already played the game, so it's, it's going in the video regardless. So, if you have a PSP, PS3, or PlayStation Vita knocking about with an American PSN account, here's one you can download and play right away. 
You know, if you ever wanted to listen to blast beats while fighting a dragon. That's gotta sound appealing to somebody out there. <laughs> The wheel will provide. Next up we have Beat Planet Music, developed by Opus Corp and released in the year 2000. And you can certainly tell what year this game came out in cause this thing is repping the Y2K aesthetic straight out the gate. Look at these cutscenes, they're glorious. Not sure about these character designs though, something about the shape of their heads and the big smiles, they're up to something. Anyway, in case the name Beat Planet Music didn't give it away, this is a music game and a pretty interesting one at that. BPM is actually a hybrid title. It's an electronic rhythm game and a music making tool. And I mean, that sounds like a match made in heaven, really. Create your own tracks and then play a rhythm game with them. What a great idea. But is BPM any good at either of these two things? Well, let's find out. I'll start by saying that I'm a huge fan of the game's visual style, from the menus and the UI to the trippy visuals during the rhythm portions. It all looks great and really complements the game's audio, which for a music game is all you can ask for, really. So BPM kind of has a plot, I think. The game takes place across these futuristic spaceports, each one representing one of the game's nine cities. Each city not only has its own unique style and theme around their home nation, but an overly happy mascot character to chat to too. And this I imagine is where any sort of explanation goes down, but this is of course entirely in Japanese, so for the most part, I've no idea what's going on plot wise, but the good news though is that the dialogue is really limited and it's also the only Japanese you'll see in the game. Everything else, once again, conveniently entirely in English, so whether it's the rhythm game or the music tools, there's thankfully no barrier to entry when playing this game. So we should probably start with the rhythm gameplay, since this is where you'll spend most of your time early on. The game does have its own original songs and you play through the game moving from one city to another completing different trials. Trials are kind of like mixes that feature anywhere from one to four songs played back to back. And your job is to move this little pulsing orange thing left to right so you activate these orange icons that come at you in time with the music. Pretty simple right? Well, that's because it is. But we all know a rhythm game is nothing without its music and this game boasts over 100 tracks on the back of the box which seems kind of large given the size of a PS1 disc you know. But yep there's actually 100 unique tracks in this game. There is a catch though. Every single song in the game is made up using a deep pool of loops and samples. When a song starts you begin by activating and looping one of the samples then you move on to another part of the track to activate and loop the next sample. And you do this bit by bit adding to the music before completing the final track. So at the beginning a song will sound like this. And by the end it'll sound a little something like this. Pretty cool eh? The problem though is that these songs tend to last about 30 to 45 seconds in total. So yes, you get a lot of songs, but they're all pretty much just quick loops that are over and done out of nowhere. And I mean, as soon as you complete a track by adding all the different parts, the game just immediately boots you over to a brand new song without any time to take in the track that you've just played.
And this is a real shame because BPM has a lot of great music. The game's choice of samples means you're going to see a lot of electronic music, shades of ambient, techno, IDM, experimental. And as soon as you start to get into a track, it's pretty much just gone in an instant. I wouldn't mind, but the game's flow is kind of all over the place too. The songs sometimes sharply drop or increase in BPM from track to track, which kind of interrupts the flow you'd want from a rhythm game. And also, while I did say the game has a lot of great music, it also has quite a lot of bad music too. And this wouldn't even be too big an issue if the actual rhythm gameplay wasn't just so... boring? It genuinely might be one of the most mechanically simple rhythm games I've ever played. All you do is press the circle button on these orange icons and there's really nothing else to it. And there's no challenge to moving across the lanes either because all of the icons just appear in a single lane one at a time. There's no weaving back and forth which could have been both fun and challenging. It's just moving to the correct lane and then tapping circle until you have to move on to the next one. Even at higher difficulties it's just mind numbingly easy. Even these little green dots, they're pretty much just for show. They just let you know how good your timing was, green if it's good, yellow if you are early, and red if you are late. There's literally nothing else to do except hit circle on the orange icon. Now I do know that all rhythm games usually involve tapping buttons to the beat, but the most simple ones usually have a cool novelty controller or gimmick to make it interesting, or if it's controller only, it will at least add some fun mechanics or heavy usage of multiple buttons to mix up the challenge and complexity. BPM to its credit plays well, but when you mix the lightning fast mix of ever changing loops and samples and stick it with mind numbingly simple one button gameplay, it just feels like a slog to get through. And you might be wondering why am I even bothering to play through all this, well, beating these trials is the key to unlocking the samples to use in the game's music maker. So if you want full use of the music making tools, you can expect to be playing this game for a few hours at least. But in the end, I'm glad that I did because the music maker is really where this game begins to shine. As we mentioned, the game's tracklist is made entirely of songs using this system here. And basically it allows you to drop up to six different samples into a track and loop them all together. Once you've unlocked most of what the game has to offer, you'll have a huge amount of sounds and beats at your disposal. And look, I wouldn't really call myself anyway talented or well-versed when it comes to making music, but this is an incredibly simple and user-friendly way to make your own stuff. But probably the most impressive aspect of the whole thing is that you can actually get samples by using your own music CDs. So you can pop in a CD, choose the track, record the part you wish to sample, and then bam, it's converted into the game for you to use. How cool is that? Once you've made your tracks, you can then convert them over to the rhythm game and play them in a mix, adding the different samples bit by bit in the order of your choosing. It's really, really cool. Of course, this doesn't make the rhythm sections any better to play, but the novelty of playing it while listening to something you put together, now that's fun. Now this system is still pretty limited. The samples on offer do really narrow down the kind of music you can make. If you're expecting to see a robust list of tools and instruments like Music 2000 or MTV Music Generator, you will be disappointed. But there's still no denying how impressive BPM's tools are, especially considering how beginner friendly it all is. In Japan, fans of the game even created and released entire albums made using the tools in this game and some of this stuff is really, really good. I've been using some of it as the background music for this section, so that should give you an idea of what to expect from the game and its tools. Definitely won't be to everybody's taste, but I know there's a lot of people out there who will really appreciate it. So, can I recommend BPM? I mean, aesthetically, I love everything about the game. As pure a Y2K experience as you can come across both audibly and visually. Is it a good rhythm game? No, not at all. But as a music tool, this is where the game really begins to shine. It's never going to match up to the breadth of features on offer from other high-profile PS1 music makers, but if you're anyway musically inclined and enjoy electronic music, you'll probably have a ball playing around with this game. The fact you've got to grind through an inconsistent mess of short songs and boring rhythm sections to actually get the game's full range of samples will put most people off, but I think the good does outweigh the bad in the end, if you're willing to put in the effort. I'll finish with a brief glimpse of a track I put together myself just to prove that even a dummy like me could make something remotely listenable within this game. will provide
last game this episode is Gegege no Kitaru, Gyakushu Yuma Daikesen. I probably butchered that game's title just there, so apologies for having to sit through that. Kitaru is a well-known comedy horror series that first appeared in the 30s as a Kameshibaya, a type of street theatre that was popular in Depression era Japan, before next appearing as a manga in the early 60s. This is my first time ever hearing of it, but Kitaru seems to be one of Japan's most beloved series and characters, appearing in a whole range of manga, anime, TV series, movies and video games over the years. Kitaru, our protagonist, is a yokai, which is a class of ghost or spirit from Japanese folklore. Kitaro is a friendly yokai, however, and spends most of his time defending the human world from other deadly yokai. Supposedly, this series is responsible for popularizing yokai in modern times, bringing elements of Japanese folklore back into the mainstream. And I mean, from Super Mario Land 2 all the way up to more obvious examples like Yokai Watch, there's a good chance you've played a game with some sort of yokai present, whether you know it or not. So, this is a licensed video game then? Well, yeah. But it's also a 2D Konami action platformer released on the PlayStation in the year 2003. And I mean, who better than Konami to try their hand at a horror-themed action platformer? Well, maybe Capcom, but any of the two is fine. So, from the get-go, expectations are high. I know this isn't 80s or 90s Konami, but the company was still releasing great games across all platforms at the time. So, how does our little buddy Kotaro fare? Well, the first thing that should stand out to most people is the visuals. This game takes place across a variety of horror-themed locations in Japan. Forests, graveyards, haunted castles and caves, all perfectly fitting in with the folklore theming and all beautifully detailed too. The character and enemy sprites all look fantastic, the enemy and boss designs in particular stealing the spotlight. To my knowledge, Kitaro is more of a light-hearted take on the horror genre aimed at kids, but they don't hold back on the horror imagery here with some genuinely creepy enemies to fight. It's both a beautiful and spooky game, and the type of quality you'd expect from Konami, with them really showcasing how good 2D games can look on the PlayStation, especially this late into the system's life cycle. The gameplay, on the other hand, feels more like an homage to action platformers of old, playing more like an 8-bit or a 16-bit game, repackaged with some modern graphical upgrades. You of course control the titular Kotaru, who you'll be jumping and shooting with throughout the game. You have three main forms of attack in-game, your trusty hair, which can be shot rapidly in a number of different directions, a charge attack, which launches your sandals in a homing attack, which locks onto any available targets on screen. The game allows you to use a charge attack at any time, but using it drops your charge level from blue to yellow to red. The more you use your charge attack, the longer it takes to fully charge up again. If you wait a little while without using a charge attack though, it will eventually charge back up to blue, which is much, much quicker than the other two levels. Lastly, you have access to a counter, which deflects certain enemy attacks back at them. This is not only handy for protecting you, but it's a great way of getting some easy damage on enemies, and it's even mandatory for damaging certain foes. That's pretty much the core of your moveset in game. You won't see any additional weapons or power-ups here. These basic attacks are all you need to master to strike down any foes you'll come across during the game. Although, shortly into the game, you do unlock the ability to summon a yokai friend into battle with you. There's a few to choose from, and they can give you access to a deployable barrier, multiple different damaging abilities, or even ways to traverse the levels quickly through the air. Most of these outside of a few aren't that useful, except for the quick travel yokai or this old guy with the spread shot. The fart guy is kind of useless, but I'm glad something this dumb does exist, so good for him. So you may think that the game follows a linear flow from level to level, but Kotaro does things a little bit differently. The game features a world map, and we start at our home base, which is this little treehouse area. From here we receive quests by letter to banish different yokai across the land. Once we answer a letter, the area opens up on the map and then we are free to visit. The game usually gives you multiple letters at once, so you have the freedom of choice in deciding where you want to go first. By the beginning, you'll have a small number of areas to visit before having a large open map by the very end of the game. What makes things interesting though is that whenever you return to your home base, you'll need to play through levels again to continue moving through the map. So the further you get in the game, the more levels you'll need to gauntlet one after another to progress. And this is easier said than done thanks to the game's health system. Kotaro can take a total of 10 hits, which is actually quite forgiving for a game like this, but the only way to heal is either by visiting your base or whenever you finish a level and you'll only regain 4 out of your 10 hit points whenever you finish a level. Now this doesn't seem bad, but Kotaro is hard. Old school hard. Enemies that are way faster than you, awkward projectiles to dodge, things falling on you out of seemingly nowhere. It can be pretty brutal. Levels are generally quite short, but getting out of one unscathed was a rarity. For me at least. 
The toughest challenge is always the boss at the end of the run, and you're really aiming to hold on to as much of your health as possible before you eventually make it to them. Because if you die, and you probably will a few times, you get sent straight back to the treehouse, needing to run the gauntlet all over again. It's quite punishing, and it also means that you'll be getting very familiar with a few of the earlier stages. This forest level in particular, I think, I needed to play about 8 times, since it branches to half of the total locations on the map. It is short, but still, it wears thin sooner rather than later. At least the bosses are banished permanently upon completion, so you don't have to worry about fighting any of them again. So, Gitaro is a pretty tough game, but I think the biggest reason for this isn't the progression or health system, it's actually down to how it feels to play. You really expect a 2D game made in the 2000s to control buttery smooth, but Gitaro feels about as stiff as a Belmont from an NES Castlevania game. He is very slow, much slower than the majority of enemies in game, and his jumps do not feel great at all. They allow for very little movement in air, so you're kind of stuck committing to the direction of your jump. Which means if something appears out of nowhere, you're more or less screwed. And that will happen often. Plus, if you fall off a platform, good luck positioning yourself mid-air to actually get back on anything. The controls are certainly manageable with a little bit of practice, but they really force you to take things slower and cautiously, just from the massive risk of losing health and how unforgiving the enemies and traps can be. Once you get comfortable with the controls and get into the swing of things, it's a lot of fun. It's very challenging, but it always makes me want to press onwards in spite of it. There's tons of great bosses to fight, and overall, it's just a beautiful game from start to finish. I just wish the gameplay was really up to the level of the visuals. There's nothing wrong with keeping things deliberately old school, but I think in this case, they actually end up holding the game back from reaching its full potential. The music is also a bit hit or miss, unfortunately. The game tries to go for a more haunting, atmospheric soundscape, with levels featuring lots of traditional Japanese instruments and ghoulish whispering, which do wonders for enhancing the game's spooky atmosphere. The problem is that while these are cool, they repeat quite often and they're sometimes a little dull as background music. The music that is here though can be pretty good, although I wouldn't count it among Konami's best by any means. Some of the boss music especially is great, but the majority of tunes are kind of forgetful, at least in my opinion. As for the language barrier, this game has by far the most Japanese we've seen in the video series so far. Plenty of voice dialogue scenes in each level offering some plot and banter between the characters. Also, all of the menus are in Japanese, which really limited me on figuring out additional options for this game. But thankfully, progressing through the game is quite easy with a little trial and error. I couldn't find any guides online, but look, if I can figure it out, you should be able to, no problem. Also, I managed to find this cool gallery section that was full of creepy images of the characters and lots of info too. Even if I don't understand what's going on, this is a really, really nice inclusion, especially for fans of the series. Overall, I did have a fun time with this one. I really wish the gameplay matched up to the level of the visuals, but if you're in the mood for an old school action platformer with old school difficulty to match, this is one of the prettier options you have available on the platform. Certainly not Konami's finest work, but a cool little gem and worth trying out for fans of Gitaro or 2D action platformers in general. And with that, it's time to close out things for Volume 2. We got to check out a 3D fantasy beat-em-up with weird music, an interesting musical hybrid that reps the Y2K aesthetic out and proud, and a late-release 2D action platformer starring one of Japan's most beloved characters. Before we finish though, at the end of each episode, I do like to slot each of the games into a different tier. Is the game a must-play? Is it worth trying if you like the look of it? Is the game trash and not worth your time? Or did I hit a brick wall and find the game unplayable due to the language barrier? Today we see a familiar sight with all three games slotting in nicely within the Troy tier. There's no beating around the bush, each of these games has some glaring flaws that hold them back from greatness, be it a severe lack of content and replayability, boring rhythm sections gating off most of the game's best content, or some rigid player movement that feels like it belongs back in the 80s. But in spite of this, these are all games I would still recommend to fans of their respective genres. Loose for Ring is an unremarkable but solid 3D beat-em-up that you'll have fun with even if it only lasts a single playthrough. 
B Planet Music's undeniable visual flair and fun yet accessible music making tools make this worth trying for more creative PlayStation fans. And Kitaro is still a beautiful game that fans of the character and old school 2D games will surely get a kick out of, including the difficulty too I'm sure. So let me know, have you tried any of these games yourself? Are there any Japanese exclusive games you'd like to see show up in the series? Drop me a comment below and if there's any games that I missed on the list, I'll be sure to get them added right away. And if you enjoyed the video, a like and subscribe is always very much appreciated. You can check out plenty more PS1 content over on the channel in the meantime, including Volume 1 of this series and my obscure and forgotten PS1 game series, which is more or less the same format if you crave a bit more random wheel action. But for now, thank you so much for joining me and I'll see you next time for Volume 3. And as always, praise the wheel. Gigi,